This meeting is being recorded. Chairs Lloyd. Do I? <clears throat> Cheers, your <clears throat> we ready? Yeah. Okay. How's everybody doing? Doing well. It's raining up here. Good last day of school. Yeah, last day of school here for our girls, or we have one left. So I now officially have a junior. Yay. Yeah, two two more years and they're gone. But they never <laughs> leave. <laughs> they never leave. <clears throat> One's back from college right now and it's a full house again. So once you can, a parent, always a parent. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and it's it's always a good thing, most mm -hmm. of the time. So as everybody can see. Tonight, we're going to be talking about food. Can I have everybody mute, please? It sounds like somebody's fixing a snack. <laughs> <clears throat> but tonight, we're talking about food. And if you can look at how I've worded our title, it's other things to eat. So there might be some other things that our grandmas and grandpas ate that may not necessarily fall into the category of what we would classify as food. So let's take a look and see what we can find they put in their tummies and maybe what they never would put in their tummies. So our objectives is, I had wanted to talk a little bit about the sacred feasts, but we're gonna to have to save that for a little time later. Uh, we just don't have enough time to jump into that because we could talk all night about the food and the celebrations and everything that was unique with them. But we're going to look at what plants our ancestors ate, what meats they ate, and what meat that they would never, ever let pass between their lips. And there was a few that they wouldn't eat that makes perfect sense, and a few others that don't really make sense as to why they wouldn't eat. We're going to talk a little bit too about some maple raccoon getaways, a couple of stories about cranberries and wild rice, and then we're going to look at some of the strange foods that they ate. So the first thing to realize is that back in the day, uh, there wasn't a convenience store. There were not grocery stores. And if you were hungry and you wanted to eat something, you either had to kill it, grow it, or go pick it up off the vines or the ground by yourself. You couldn't just go out and buy something whenever you got hungry. If you got hungry and there wasn't something to eat, you stayed hungry. And I mentioned the sacred feasts. The sacred feasts are interesting because each one of them dealt with some unique traditions regarding food. Not every single one of the sacred feasts was a a, a feast of food. Some of them were a little sparse on foods. And we'll talk about that sometime later. But fresh fruits, vegetables, and berries were a very special treat for our grandmas and grandpas. What they had to eat, they picked from the vine, and they didn't have refrigerators or anything like that, obviously, to keep anything fresh. They jerked a lot of venison. They parched a lot of corn. And a lot of the food, hold on a second. Okay, I'm back. The mama was locked out the door. And a lot of the food that they had was buried either in the longhouse or outside of the longhouse to protect it from any of the pests that were out there and equally hungry. So what do you think were the most favored delicacies that the grandmas and grandpas ate? List them right there. Maple sugar, roasted sweet corn, and the flesh and oil of the black bear. That was the most favored meat that the ancestors ate. 
And when it came to roasting the corn, how did they roast it? Does anybody want to venture as to how they actually roasted the ears of corn? BNO Walker mentions how the grandmas and grandpas roasted the corn. Does any of the walkers want to take a guess as to how they roasted? I read how they did it, and he said that they would dig a long pit, build a fire in it over the coals, then they'd take a, a green limb and they'd lean the, the corn over it. But he said that uh, once they got chicken wire, it was so much easier. Yeah. Yeah, they would build a, a big pit, put a lot of coals in it. Uh, There's some other um, examples of where they would actually throw the ears of corn with the husk going into the pit and cover it up and just let it sit there for a while and just roast. Otherwise, they would put the ears of corn above this pit of, of coals and just let it sit there and Lord, roast. I think we may have us. Do what? It was like a long pause there. I don't know if it was on my end or everybody. Well, the black bear. It may but, just be mine. You can go on. Okay. The black bear was the most favorite meat. And the black bear also provided something else that was a delicacy. And it was the black bear's oil. The black bear's oil was pretty much liquid at room temperature, can be compared a lot like olive oil today in many ways. And it was used as a dipping and sipping sauce. It was omnipresent at just about every meal when it was available. And the oil of the bear was so heavily consumed that it would kind of just ooze out of the pores of the people. Their skin had quite a bit of a sheen from the oil that they ate off of the black bear. So the black bear was very, very important. You can't talk about food without talking about the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash. We mentioned squash quite frequently, but the squash is actually more defined as a pumpkin. Um, pictures here on the screen show what the, the vegetables most likely would have looked like. And in addition to the three sisters, there was the weird little brother and he was known as tobacco. And then you had the pretty flirty little cousin. She was the sunflower. And they, along with corn, beans, and squash, were the five most important uh, plants that were grown and harvested by the ancestors. These five plants are the ones that made the Iroquoian people rather unique in the Ontario homeland. The plants that our grandmas and grandpas ate, obviously, corn, beans, and pumpkins were important. The sunflowers they ate, they also boiled the seeds of the sunflower and got the oil for their paint and their hair. They ate cattails, pawpaw, persimmon, all the berries, black straw, black and blue and every color available. Dandelions were important. Nuts of all kinds and wild rice. We'll talk about some wild rice here in a little bit. But there were also many, many, many different herbs, roots and leaves that they ate and used for medicinal purposes that are far too many to start naming. Uh, the wild rice has an interesting story behind it. And Charles Trowbridge mentioned the wild rice, how it was so abundant in the marshes and the creeks in Michigan and Ohio, and also in Wisconsin, when we were in Wisconsin. But in the early 1800s, he made a notation that the grandmas and grandpas did not use wild rice and they chose to not eat it for a specific reason. We'll see what that was here in a little bit. The meat that everybody ate, deer, buffalo, bear, uh, elk, the buffalo and the elk, they walked and they were in great herds upon the Sandusky Plains. The buffalo and the elk were important, porcupine, otter, uh, turtles, frogs, quail, just about anything out there that would be available to, to actually harvest was eaten. You'll notice here too that the golden eagle was on the list of foods that they would eat. And all the fish that they could get both from the streams, uh, the rivers, and from the Great Lakes. 
And out of all of these different meats, which one do you think was the most important meat? Not the one that they favored as a delicacy, which was the, the black bear, but which of these meats was the most important meat for our ancestors? And the next question is, which one did they eat that would be equivalent to our chicken today? Does anybody want to take a guess on either one of those questions? Would it be the turtle? No, it wasn't the turtle. The most, yep, the most important meat that they had was the white-tailed deer. The deer provided a lot of the meat. It was extremely lean. So they jerked a lot of the meat from the white-tailed deer. They also did the buffalo, but the white-tailed deer was the most important meat. And the one that would be equivalent to our chicken today that could have been found on a table anywhere within the nation at any given time was the, nobody wants to guess, it was the raccoon. They ate a lot of raccoon in conjunction with the white-tailed deer. And oddly enough, if you've had both venison and, and the raccoon, they both taste very similar to each other. The big difference is a lot more greasy than the venison, but they taste remarkably alike. Maybe that's why they were so important. What meats would they never eat? There were some meats that they would prefer to just starve to death rather than eat. Uh, the crow and the raven, uh, the bald eagle. They would not eat the bald eagle or they would eat the golden eagle. Whippoorwills, bats, snakes. They wouldn't touch a snake. Toad, salamanders, coyote, wolf, and cougar. None of those that they would even begin to dream of eating. And Charles Trowbridge also made a, a notation that they would literally starve before they would touch any of those meats to eat. And was anybody want to venture as to why? Well, I would imagine with, the, with some of those, the crow and the raven, buzzards, they eat carrion. Yeah. And they might not have wanted to um, ingest that animal who had eaten other dead animals. That's just a, a wild guess. That's a pretty good guess. Uh, they did not like anything that ate carrion, and especially if any of those animals, birds, whatever, would ever, ever, ever feast upon a human, they would never eat the flesh of that animal. Our ancestor detested the thought of anything related to human flesh. And if an animal ate it, in their minds, it was no different than they eating the flesh of the human, even though it was eaten by a different animal. And they never, ever would touch the mink because they detested snakes, although they highly respected snakes. They would never just outright kill a snake, with the exception of the rattlesnake and copperhead. Rattlesnakes and copperheads were killed on site because they were aggressive, but they would never eat the snakes because, or the, the snakes and the mink, because the mink ate the snakes and they would never eat a snake. When did they eat? Did they have three meals a day like we have today? Did they have breakfast, dinner, and then supper or supper, dinner, however you want to say it? Um, no, they had one meal. They would have a morning breakfast. It was basically a big pot of stew. And the whole family, everybody in the longhouse, everybody in the lodge would sit down and they would have a large family meal. And they would eat until they were full or they would eat until the, the large pot was emptied. If the pot was not emptied, then they would set it aside. And throughout the day, if people were hungry and needed a little snack, they'd just take a little bit when they needed it. At the end of the day, if they needed to eat something more, then they would have parched corn, they'd have jerky, they'd have fruits and vegetables, anything that they would have. But there was just one single meal, and it was the meal to begin the day. And it was a family event. Family was so important. Now the maple raccoon getaways. I put this in here because there were two annual events that were paramountly important. There was the sugar camps, and predominantly the sugar camps would have been held through the month of January, January, February, and March, uh, the citizens would abandon to almost the nth degree. They would abandon the villages 
break out into small little camps, large families, uh, predominantly clans, and they would settle forming their little teeny tiny camps and they would harvest the sugar. They were annual events that they would never ever under any circumstances give up. They were their vacations, if you will. And in conjunction with the, the annual sugar camps, they had the annual raccoon hunts. The raccoon hunts happened predominantly in December, November, December, January, but predominantly December. And the men and the women would go out on the raccoon hunts and they were just a festive time for everybody to get together, enjoy nature and enjoy themselves. But there was one big event that happened in December of 1840 after the raccoon hunts was coming to a close. Does anybody have any idea what that big event was that literally changed the destiny of the nation? Does anybody know what happened in December of 1840? Everybody heard of Samumdawat, Chief Samumdawat? In 1840, he was coming back from the Black Swamp back to Upper Sandusky. And he was with his niece and nephew, and they had stopped en route from the Black Swamp to Upper Sandusky for a night's stay. And they were visited by two, maybe three gentlemen that came into the camp, and they were acting like friends, and they were hungry, and they asked if they could have a little bit to eat. Samum Dewat was very quick to oblige them, because he was not only head chief at the time of the nation, but he was also a Methodist minister. He had his papers. He was a preacher. And he invited everybody in, they had dinner, they settled down, and then while Samum Dwat and his niece and nephew were asleep, these men woke up and literally chopped them into pieces with camp axes. And a lot of people say that they were, that the men were stealing the, the raccoon pelts and the dogs that Samum Dwat had. But in my opinion, it was an assassination because he was adamantly opposed about the move to Indian territory. And I do believe that the U.S. government sent in these assassins and they killed Samumdawat, which his death eventually led to everybody agreeing to move. In 1842, the treaty was signed. In 43, we basically packed up and left. And a lot of it was because of Samumdawat's death. But the, the camps were annual and they would have never abandoned anything else for the sugar or the raccoon hunts. Tradition and tragedy. Cranberries. Cranberries have a really interesting story, and they were also very important to the grandmas and grandpas. They had a lot of cranberries because of the marshes that were there in Ohio and Michigan at the time. And there was one marsh that was very important to our ancestors, and it's known today as the Big Bone Lick. The Big Bone Lick, just a little to the southeast or southwest of Cincinnati, in Kentucky would have been the equivalent of the Holy Bible's Garden of Eden because it was at the Big Bone Lick that our grandmas and grandpas believed that the woman who fell from above actually came and lived upon the Great Island. And it was such an important place that all the animals would come and just visit with her. That's why there are so many bones of all these animals that can be found. And the bad twin, uh, obviously he was adamantly against everything that was good. And he helped create, he developed, however you wanna, you, you wanna say it, the witch buffaloes. The witch buffaloes were these monsters and they were sent in by the good twin to take over the Big Bone Lick area, the, the, the Garden of Eden, if you will. And they were just terrorizing everything. So the animals asked our ancestors to come in and defeat the witch buffaloes, which they did. They soundly defeated them. And the blood of the witch buffaloes ran so deep and it was so thick in the marsh that it turned into cranberries. And the cranberries to this day are bitter and they are sour and they're difficult to eat because they are the, the remnants of the witch, blood, the witch buffalo's blood. And wild rice. Wild rice was something that our ancestors at one point would have eaten pretty predominantly alongside the corn. But during the exile in Wisconsin, uh, they didn't take a lot of corn with them 
so they were more dependent upon the wild rice while in Wisconsin than while in Ontario. While they were out in Wisconsin, they, they met the Sioux, and they thought the Sioux were a weak, passive people. They had no respect for them because every time they would hug you, they would just cry. And there were so many Sioux that they were referred to as being as numerous as the fall blowing leaves. Our ancestors did not know how many Sioux actually lived upon the plains. And twice we attacked the Lakota people. Uh, the second time that we attacked them, or the first time we attacked them, we basically banished ourselves in our banishment down to the Black River and the Mississippi River. We stayed there for a while until. 1671, we decided to go ahead and attack them again because we wanted the land in the Wisconsin area. So we attacked them. Uh, they basically corralled us and rounded us up into the marshes there um, in North Wisconsin. And they surrounded the marshes that we were in because they had a number of warriors that they could do that. And one out of 100 of our warriors survived Basically, the Sioux massacred every single one of our warriors but one in the wild rice fields. Because of that, our ancestors from that time on did not partake of the wild rice because it brought back bad memories of that massive defeat that our ancestors suffered at the hands of the Lakota people. So wild rice today, some of us eat it. I don't know if many people know that story, but a lot of our people do eat rice. Now, some things that were a little bit different when it came to what our grandparents ate. Dogs were a animal that was looked at as being the most important for humans to have. It was our greatest friend and our ancestors would never eat the meat of a dog. We had in most cases, each family would have multiple dogs and they were described as being kind of a variation of a wolf. And there was at one point, uh, the Seneca white dog feast. And the Seneca would feast this dog that was supposed to be pure. They would burn it and they would eat the flesh and they would let the smell of the dog go up to the great spirit. And at one point, some of our ancestors actually kind of tell end on that and they did eat wild or they did eat their dogs for a while but for the most part we never ate a dog it was done in ceremony and Monocchio he kind of ridiculed the the Seneca for sending up to the great spirit the smell of a dog and how he didn't think that the great spirit would appreciate that so dogs were eaten in ceremony and here we have the meal that came with its own bowl. While they were out in the forest and on the plains of the Sandusky Plains, there were turtles everywhere. And it was very easy for them to take a turtle and if they could cut off its head even better because it wouldn't squirm nearly as much, but they would take a turtle and they would build a little fire and they would take the turtle, turn him upside down, place him on the fire, and just let it sit there and roast. When it got to the point where he was cooked enough or she was cooked enough, the bottom part of the shell would just peel right off. Then they would sit there and they would eat the, the rest of the turtle through its own supplied bowl, which is actually pretty smart and pretty convenient because it's a very tasty little treat, which I haven't tried yet. Ah, grub worms were everywhere in the forest and out in the plains. And the grub worms, does anybody know what the grub worms basically mature into? Around here, we see them mature a lot around here uh, in Missouri, Oklahoma, central US. Uh, they mature a lot into the June bugs that are a pest everywhere. But the grandmas and grandpas would take these grub worms, which some of them would get to be pretty good size and they would roast them and then they would eat them. They were bitter if they were just eaten by themselves without any type of roasting. But grub worms were also an interesting meal that everybody would eat from time to time. Crickets and grasshoppers were important. Uh, they were a quick little snack that they could catch on the fly. Nice little crunch, a nice little taste. Nowadays, they are considered kind of a, 
nice little snack when they are covered with chocolate. But a lot of cultures today still eat crickets and, grass, and grasshoppers. Very uh, high in protein. They are very high in protein. Yeah. Yes, they're and actually- You can, you can actually, get cricket flour too. Yeah, they are considered an excellent food source. I don't know how many of us would eat them today, but they are actually a very good food to eat. What about book lice and corn weevils? Everybody heard of those? There was so much corn. They would have corn that they would pound into meal. They had just the corn husks, or not the husks, but the kernels. And they would have so much of this sitting around that in time, it was inevitable for the corn meal and the corn to get infested with the book lice and the corn weevil. Nowadays, have you ever gone to the pantry, pulled out your flour, opened it up and seen the little things in there squirming and working their way around? What do you do with it? You throw it out, then you hop in the car, you drive to your favorite grocery store and you buy some more. Back then, they couldn't do that. Food was so precious that even if it was infested with book lice and the corn weevils, they ate it. And there's no telling how much of the book lice that they ate. They could not throw out their food supply. They throw it out because it had a little bit of a bug working in it. They might would starve. So in addition to the cornmeal and the corn itself, they ate the book lice and the corn weevil along with it. They had to, to survive. In conjunction with the book lice and the corn weevil, hmm, maggots and head lice. There are plenty of accounts where they ate the maggots, they ate the head lice. It wasn't something that they would do very often, but out of need and necessity, from time to time, they would eat those, which actually maggots are kind of like what the grasshoppers considered a pretty good food. Really gross. But back then, you ate what you could get. Something that is very popular today is the survival foods, these high protein, high calorie things that people just consume right and left. The original survival food, and it kind of tied in with the war feast, because during the war feast, the warriors and only the warriors, the women were not permitted to participate. They would go and they would harvest either a deer, an elk, a moose, a bear, whatever they could get. And the object was for them to eat the whole animal before they would leave to go off to war. And they could only go in an even number of warriors. Never did our warriors go to war with an odd number. They always went with a pair, with a buddy, with a friend, always even in an even number. Before they would go, they would eat this animal in its entirety. And rather than drink water, with their, their meal, they would drink glasses, if you will, of the bear oil. So they would just drink this bear oil, eat the whole animal, so that they would have plenty of energy in which to deal with their long treks. And with them, they would take either parched corn or they would take the pemmican. And it was predominantly buffalo tallow. They used the, the fat of the buffalo and then they would dry and beat into powder either the buffalo or the venison into just a real fluffy powder, add maple sugar with it, maybe throw in some blueberries or cranberries for a little, little extra taste. And that's predominantly what they ate when they were out on the war path. And they didn't really have a desire to start a fire because it would give up their location, either the, the light or the smell so they would eat the parched corn and the pemmican. Predominantly, that's the only thing they ate. Lastly, we already kind of talked about it. People, they taste like chicken, or so some of our friends thought. The Ottawa, the Chippewa, the Potawatomi, many of the other Algonquian nations, they were cannibals. They were eating the flesh of the Americans all the way up through and to the War of 1812. That was something that was absolutely abhorrent to our 
ancestors. They would never eat the flesh of a human. Although in the old days, it was quite customary to eat the heart of an enemy that you had basically taken the life off in coup, in coup, because you would assume the qualities and everything strength of that enemy that you just ate. But after we became Wyandotte, we never ate any human flesh. We were not cannibals. Although we would sit back and we would see a lot of our friends sit there and roast an American or roast a British or roast an enemy of their, of their nation and eat it. It was predominantly the hearts and the thighs that they would eat, the leg. Um, but rest assured, we did not think that the human flesh tasted like chicken. That's it. Any questions about any of that? And there's a lot more that we could have talked about, but we're trying to keep the time uh, conservative. But if you got any questions about anything, there's, I think, a number of people here that have a really good knowledge base on foods and what people eat and ate and loved and didn't like. So time to talk. B&O talked about uh, Tone Ta, which was, uh, he said, was often taken on hunting and war parties. It was uh, basically ground parched corn, usually mixed with either salt or maple sugar. Yeah, that parched corn was almost inseparable. It was basically a snack. They would carry a pouch of parched corn. And the parched corn that we're talking about, because I like corn nuts. Uh, that's one of the things that I, out of tradition, will always, always, without exception, take when I'm out hunting. I always take corn nuts. And corn nuts is not the same as parched corn. Parched corn was pretty much omnipresent during the times that the women were in the fields, the time that the men were out uh, on the war path, or they were hunting, or they were just out doing manly things. That pouch of corn was with them everywhere. And to make it just a little less bland, salt and maple syrup, sugar, as it was referred to, was used a lot. Uh, B&O has some really good recipes for some corn that was published by, um, I want to say Better Homes and Garden, but it wasn't that. And the Oklahoma Historical Society, they published his recipes for corn. And if you haven't seen those or you don't have them, they're a nice, interesting way to cook up some corn delicacies. I can see B&O as, as being a master chef himself. B&O talks about hominy and um, some of the books I've been reading talk about hominy. I'm pretty sure that takes a strong caustic like lye. And I was trying to think possibly um, before there was lye, I'll bet they used uh, the, the wood ash, which is uh, potassium hydroxide instead of sodium hydroxide. Anyway, that was something he talked about several times was hominy. Right, You're, you are correct. They would use the ash from the fires. They used that ash to create the hominy. Uh, the corn they used in so many different ways. The corn was very important. Uh, without the corn, uh, the Wyandotte people, the Iroquoian people, would have just been another nation. But obviously we took corn, we used it, uh, became, and, and through the greatness, became a, a, a nation, a people of greatness. The corn was, was paramountly important for that. Yeah, the easiest way, or the recipe, my understanding of using these hardwood ashes, use one handful of ashes to two handfuls of corn. And then you just take it and boil it until the, the husk come off and rinse it. And you can either dry it or continue cooking it and eat it then. Mm -hmm. And that's what corn nuts is made from. Uh, it's actually a special kind of corn that comes up from Central America. But corn nuts is parched hominy. It's good stuff. Nice crunch. Except for when your teeth start getting a little older and they just, you know, they're awful crunchy at that point. So any more comments? I was just going to say, um, we grew up with stories about um, Vienno's brother 
Thomas also being a very good cook. My, my mother talked about Grandpa Walker and his recipes and uh, what a good cook he was too. Just, yeah. just a passing comment. Well, there's a number of our ancestors that were amazing. b &O, it would have been so nice to have been able to sit down and just talk with him around an old black pot belly stove or a fireplace and just listen to him tell the stories and listen to him play his piano and just be being oh um, those times would have been so wow to have experienced and I never did that that that's amazing yeah uh, that and, I'm yeah. jealous <laughs> yeah my great grandmother talked very fondly of of Uncle Bert and his stories and how much she enjoyed him anytime he came to their house uh here in seneca he would he would she would follow him everywhere yeah you can almost sit and and as you're reading tales of the bark lodges just see him listen to him tell the stories with that broken one dot and english dial dialogue that he had and yeah that would have been a good time yeah, that was his aunt, Catherine Gray Eyes, which everybody referred to as Kitty, mm -hmm. that told him the stories. Yeah. Anybody else got any thoughts, comments? Okay. On the bear oil. And listening to them eat a lot of corn. Wouldn't that, I mean, to do that today, wouldn't that be unhealthy? Well, I've equated the bear oil as being very similar to olive oil today. And how many of you have ever gone to a nice Italian restaurant, Greek restaurant, where they serve uh, a multitude of different things like breads? And all you do is you sit there and you dip your bread into the olive oil and spice mixture and you just eat it that way. The, the olive oil and the bear oil were not the polyunsaturated or the monounsaturated. They were polyunsaturated, which means they did not have the, the bad characteristics of the, the lards and the fats and the oils that are so man changed and altered nowadays. It was actually considered extremely healthy for you. But and I mean, now, they're, they're also spending all their time getting food. It's not like the land of abundance that we have. Right. Where we're sitting in front of a computer and not burning energy to get our calories. That's true. Yeah. They needed a lot more calorie intake than what we do today because they were constantly on the go. They were constantly hunting. They were constantly trading. They were constantly working the fields. They weren't sitting back watching TV or Facebooking or anything of that nature. So that calorie intake was important. And the bear oil, it was actually considered medicinal. It was such a fine oil. And if you go and you Google nowadays bear oil, look at how expensive that is. You cannot buy it cheap and it's not easily found because it is not only a food item, but it was considered medicinal as well. Our bodies are also amazing that they can uh, change carbohydrates into proteins when it's needed. So, mm -hmm. has anybody ever had black bear? Yes. Yes. I haven't had it yet. Missouri's finally opened up a black bear season, and I can't wait to go. That's the one thing that that. I'd rather almost rather have than white tail. So when is the season, Lloyd? Uh, the season is early fall, but it's it's a raffle. You have to put in for it and take the luck of the draw. Right now, it's a lot of landowners that are getting the the tags because of it being so new to the state. One of these days, we'll get a black bear. I've told Linda I'm going to put me a big black bear robe on the bed at some point. 
<laughs> she doesn't quite agree with that. <laughs> you may find yourself on the couch with that. Black with black that robe. robe, yeah, most definitely. <laughs> So some of these things that we've mentioned tonight, has everybody had a chance to try venison? Um, I know I've asked Kim from time to time about the raccoon. One of these days, I'm gonna have Kim eat some raccoon, but turtles as well. Has anybody ever had a turtle, raccoon, or anything like that that was considered uh, a normal thing to eat? Grandpa would always fix raccoon, or well, I've eaten raccoon too, but grandpa would always catch the turtles and, um, cook them yes mm -hmm. yeah i've had it tastes like chicken right no <laughs> depends on what part <laughs> yeah yeah but you saw from that little quote that i put up there that they ate everything they didn't just eat the meat they ate everything that was a part of the turtle and that was a characteristic that we have a hard time understanding today Nothing that they killed, nothing that they ate, nothing that they harvested ever went to waste. They would use just about everything of the deer, of the bear, of the elk, of the plants. Uh, they were great at making sure that everything that was given to them was used to its fullest extent. And they took advantage of everything, even the turtles when they ate it. As you can see there, they ate the ants with the guts of the turtle. Yum, yum, yum. And the blood, yum, yum. So times were different back then. We are so spoiled and we're so, uh, yeah, we're soft. So any more thoughts or comments? You can see where a lot of that just sounds awful today, but you know, back then, yeah, they didn't they didn't know anything else, so it's probably great. Yeah. That was the only thing they knew. They didn't yeah. have anything else. They didn't have the the uh, domesticated animals that we have here. And and I think they did pretty darn well for with what was available on this amazing piece of land we live on. Yeah, I didn't mention anything about the domesticated animals because, as you say, they didn't have anything until after the Europeans showed up. Uh, however, there is there's one instance where some of the Jesuit missionaries did mention that the the, the neutral nations uh, they were or at least one of the neutral nations were known to have domesticated the white-tailed deer and they raised them in pens. So domesticated animals was something that was not predominantly done prior to the arrival of the Europeans because the animals were just an equal part of nature, no different than our grandmas and grandpas were. And you cannot take an animal and hold it against its will. That's no different than slavery. So the domestication of animals was something that was totally foreign uh, to the concept of our ancestors when the Europeans arrived. And they were a little hesitant to actually take an animal and hold it in hostage. The dog was our omnipresent friend, and you cannot hold a dog in hostage. Uh, if he wants to leave, he's going to leave. So the only domesticated animal that they had was the wolf. And he had the freedom to come and go at his pleasure. When the Europeans did arrive, what became the most important domesticated animal that we had? from the Europeans. There were two in particular. Does anybody want to venture to guess what the most important domesticated animals that the Europeans gave us were? Horses and cattle. Horses were important, yes, but they didn't eat the horse. Oh, well then, okay, <laughs> pigs. <laughs> yes, the pig. The pig became very important. Uh, we had more pigs in the nation than all the other domesticated animals combined. Pig became, the hogs became an important food item. Behind the hog, what else was important? Chickens. Chickens, yes. They were simply referred to as the domesticated fowl. And they didn't start eating the chickens on the table 
until after like we moved to Indian Territory because then the raccoons became kind of sparse. But they had the chickens not because they were eating them back in the days of Michigan and Ohio, but our grandmas and grandpas, they had an affinity to the eggs. They raised the chickens not for the meat of the chicken. They kept the chickens simply for the eggs. And there's a lot of um, notations made during the raccoon hunts and the maple camps that they would take the chickens and they would keep them in the pens and they use them exclusively for the eggs. They would sit down in the morning and have a big old ham and egg breakfast with biscuits. Is there any record of them eating um, more, eating eggs of, of fowl that were um, indigenous to this continent? Well, geese, duck, yes. Huh? They yep. ate those eggs? Yes. And then it became so much easier for them to actually keep the domesticated fowl around the villages. They didn't have to go out and to the, the other birds that laid the eggs. They were migratory, so they didn't have them year round until the Europeans brought in the chickens. Then they kept them pretty much exclusively for the eggs. So on the raccoon hunts, they would do that in, you said in December? In the winter, yeah, in predominantly winter. December is when they would go. Winter time, when it was cold, they do the raccoon hunts. And, and why do you suppose that they did it in December when it was cold? Um, you ever hunted a raccoon? No. That's the reason I don't have any they, idea. Yeah, they, the raccoons, they are amazing. Those little teeny tiny cute little animals are vicious. They can tear into some coon hounds. They can just rip them from limb to limb as though they were just nothing. The, the raccoon, they were predominantly in the, the, the dens of the trees. And they were not nocturnal or they were not um, a, an animal that hibernated. They were up year round and they would hunt them in the, the winter because it was so much easier for them to smoke the raccoons out of their dens in the trees because they would pretty much live together for the warmth that they could provide. And they would smoke the raccoons out of the trees, which made it a lot easier for them to harvest them. Okay. And they use the dogs and the dogs being a breed of the wolves, uh, they were not as easily overpowered by the raccoons as what the um, coon dogs of today would be. Raccoons were a fierce, fierce little animal. <laughs> Any more questions? Let's see one here on the chat. Kim just messaged me just a little while ago. Uh, there, now there she is. Her internet keeps going out. And she's basically given us the heads up that when everybody's done, that we can just go ahead and dismiss ourselves. <laughs> so if, if there aren't any more questions, how long we've been going? Almost an hour. There's, uh, time. I I have one last question. I mean, seeing Chris and how many gallons of, of, of uh, sap they got and boiled down, I mean, how many gallons do you think that they would have had to have harvest if had enough maple sugar to last them the year? Uh, I've never seen for the actually had a amount of gallons of the the water the sap from the trees uh, the only time that I've seen some gallons put together and I can't remember how much it is I've got it in my book but they didn't have you know like gallons and gallons and gallons and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gallons of maple sugar 
it was such a fine, precious commodity that it was a delicacy because of that. It got to the point where the maple trees became, uh, there, there are some diseases that do attack maple trees. Mm -hmm. uh, the maple trees uh, became hard to find. That was one of the determining factors as to whether or not we would give up the Grand Reserve. We had to have found an equal amount of maple trees in the land that they were trying to move us to before we consider moving. It was that important. And they couldn't find that equal amount of maple trees out west because there's not as many maple trees here, obviously, in the Midwest as there is in the Northeast. But they began to supplement the lack of maple sugar when they moved to Indian Territory with domesticated bees. So honey began to, in time, it didn't ever replace the maple sugar, but it began to complement the lack of having as much as they used to in the old days. But they had gallons and gallons of maple sugar, and it got to the point where they had a large amount of honey that they also had. BZ says that 10 gallons of maple sap boils down to one quart of maple syrup. That's a lot of boiling down, 10 gallons for one quart. Lloyd? Kim's um, back. Hi, Kim. This, um, this discussion on the maple syrup, of course, is, is being boiled down in uh, a container that they would have got after contact. But is, is there any evidence that they boiled the sap down prior to that? Uh, yes. Even after contact with Europeans and they had cast iron or copper mm -hmm. kettles, um, even as early or as late as the 1820s, 1830s, they still would not use the European cookware. They would not take the cast iron skillets. They would not take the copper skillets into the forest for their maple camps. Mm -hmm they would build their own utensils directly there in the forest. And there's some good pictures of, uh, is it Catherine uh, McGee? Um, goodness, can't even think of her first name, Mary McGee. Um, when we did the Barbeau exhibit, we had one of her uh, maple sugar troughs that was handmade out of bark. Mm -hmm. They would make these troughs out of bark and they would use it, usually they would hold about two gallons of syrup of, of water. And they use those handmade troughs in the forest as their means to transport the, the watery sap and boil down the sap into sugar. So they made their utensils on the spot and it was bark utensils. Mary Williams was born in a maple camp. That's really cool. Yeah. Kind of hard to say bye, isn't it? When we get to talking like this. Is everybody planning on coming to the, uh, the annual meeting and to Wyandotte in September? Yes. If everybody does, we just need to get down by the rotunda or someplace, and we just need to sit and talk all night, guys. There's so much that we could talk about. We've done it before, and that's, that's special times when we can get together and just talk and share and tell stories, and, and wow, it's, it's great. But it's now been an hour, and... Travel guide when you get there. There's plenty of places that we could go. It'd be nice to do another tour of the Wyandotte area at some point in the in the future. But any more questions or anything? Tejame. Been another great one, Lloyd. Good. I'm delighted.